This is Unlock Ukraine with legend of human rights defense, Oleksandra Matvichuk. Oleksandra, welcome. What does it mean, a Russian defeat? Uh, for example, uh, our military uh, generals, they talk about the gray zone. Uh, 100 kilometers, for example, say, Budanov, so that we need 100 kilometers of gray zone, a demilitarization zone. Uh, and this is give for us like uh, possibilities for peace, really peace in, in our land. Uh, how, what, what do you think about it? Can you comment somehow? I'm not a military expert. So I can't um, comment from the military point of view, but I know for sure before Russian people will reflect the imperialistic culture, we and a lot of other countries are in constant danger. And to reflect, they need to go through the system of justice. Yes, and they have to be military defeated. This is the only way which can push them. Uh, we have touched upon uh, re-education um, and um, wiping off our identity from this world. These are the aspects of genocide. When you go to the events where you are a keynote speaker, do you talk about that? What do you f what do you see? What do you hear from people? Which feedback? Because we don't we don't hear much um, about genocide. We hear like war crimes maybe crimes against humanity, but very little about genocide. But what's happening in Ukraine, it is. It is because when we look even to this uh, forcible deportation of Ukrainian children and re-educate them as Russians in these re-education camps or uh, forcible adoption in Russian families, it's a puzzle of general genocidal picture like it's a one component of genocidal policy. I can add a lot of more components, like the public statements of Putin that Ukrainians are not exist, which then transferred by Russian propagandists in more clear way that Ukrainians have to be re-educated as Russians or killed. So or, intention is there. There is yes. There you see the intention. Yeah. Also, another component: how Russian troops behave in occupied territories. They deliberately exterminate active local people, not just mayors or deputies, journalists, civil society leaders, priests, volunteers, artists. Because when you liquidate local elites, like active people who have some reputation and and, and to express the will of the people of their uh, in, in the nation. different fields. Yeah. They can control others and mm -hmm. save control over the region. Also, uh, when Russians came, they prohibited Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture, and you can be subjected to torture and painful deaths only for visible sign with Ukrainian identity. I remember this very sensitive and touching uh, video from Kherson uh, region where people uh, duck the Ukrainian flag with a hidden in earth because they're afraid to keep them in their own flat and they not liquidate this Ukrainian flag they hide them they hide it I saw the video yes and it was very touching so it's it's a genocide, but international community is very reluctant. Uh, in I will tell you what the problem is. The problem is that when we speak about term of genocide, uh, Rafael Lemkin, who defined this term, he included in the term the meaning of forcible changing of identity. Like you don't have to be a lawyer to understand this. If you want to, to liquidate some nation, you can forcibly change identity of people and nation will disappear. Like, it's common sense. But when we speak about international standards, the UN Convention on Genocide, they, this document didn't include this component. This is a problem. But the law is not conservative material. I'm a lawyer. I know that law developed. 
So we have to not to say that, okay, we have this restriction in international law, it's very difficult to prove genocidal intent in uh, killing and, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, like, uh, things like uh, deliberate destroying of uh, civil infrastructure for Ukrainian people. Uh, and that is why we, we will stop this attempt. Mm -hmm. No, we have to fight to call the things what they are and change uh, the international uh, legislation for better. But de facto, the International Criminal Court, by issuing the order, the warrant, uh, arrest warrant for Putin, they, not expressively, but they sort of recognize genocide because abduction of Ukrainian children is an intent. Um, they qualified it like war crimes. And my point is that this war crimes is a component of genocidal policy. Mm -hmm. But International Criminal Court have done their job. Mm -hmm. They based on, on concrete uh, legal norm. And we as a human being have done our job. And if we see that international law not have, have a gap and not provide the security for people from, from the point of view uh, like forcible change their identity to make the whole nation disappear. We have to work with this problem and fill this gap. Like this is, has to be a logic. And uh, uh, the question of uh, this criminal world to Putin, uh, his power, uh, I mean institutional power like a president, still exist after yeah, whether he is legitimate president or well, let's say uh, res, let's re rephrase it whether his people who represent him ambassadors prime minister whoever how legitimate are they if they are executing the order of a person who has um, an international arrest warrant he in um, like for one side he's a car acting head of Russian state and parallel, he is uh, officially suspected for criminals. And this combined. And that is why I'm so grateful for this uh, decision of International Criminal Court, because it will have a long-term perspective when we will see Putin in The Hague. And uh, all people who tell it nothing happened, let's remind the example of Serbia which didn't want to transfer Karadzic or Milosevic to The Hague, but supposed to do it when Serbia decided to restore the economical and other connections with uh, civilized uh, world. But even in short term it's very important because still there are politicians who want to return to business as usual with Russia. When we speak about corruption it's not just Ukrainian problem, sorry. <laughs> uh, let me remind you a huge scandal in Council of Europe when people from well-developed democracies obtained money and caviar from Azerbaijan. Well, that's the situation with vice president for money from Qatar, for example. Or, let's go to Germany, let's go to France, yeah, yeah. about this Russian, yeah. or to Austria, with Russian money, who, uh, who used by politicians, by businessmen, to lobby Russian interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here, for example, in Belgium, uh, still exists a oil, uh, oil company and for example the increased level of trade uh, during 2022 uh, Belgium with Russia increased level uh, on uh, 193 percent it's uh, three times more than China uh, have for with Russia mm. in the same period uh, and uh, how is happening because this oil company start actively buy uh, Russian oil before they get the roof mm -hmm. you know and yeah, and uh, I, I, I very well know, you know, <laughs> and see this on the example because in Belgium we, we, we very clear see this uh, uh, in, uh, in their political life, uh, in their decision, uh, because for example, uh, uh, also situation with nuclear plant, and when uh, they close one of reactor. Uh, and this guy who take this decision, this like a mi ministry of green or something like this, he named it, uh, his position, uh, and uh, he ex uh, member board of director of uh, Gazprom. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so you know. okay so <laughs> a lot of visible ties yes. because when yes. the top politicians uh, of uh, countries of EU uh, when they resign like surprisingly, surprisingly mm -hmm. uh, be become a, a member of the board of Gazprom mm -hmm. how it can be but now we have a window of opportunity and in order to establish international accountability mechanism we have to work with international uh, partners in march last year i started to ask to myself for whom do we document all these crimes who will provide justice to people with whom we have spoke and this is a huge responsibility i remember when in first years of the war, when we systematically interviewed people who survived from Russian captivity, and I always asked them whether or not they apply to national uh, in legal uh, in law enforcement bodies. And uh, a, a huge part of people answered no, because we have no hope that justice will be achievable. Our perpetrators are in occupied territories, or even uh, when these territories will be released, they will go to Russia, and Russia will never transfer them, and so, so on. And then I asked, but you came to me. And suddenly I understood that even people who say we have no hope that justice will be achievable, they have this last hope like they tell their story and horrible details with the last hope maybe is there a chance to get justice sooner or later and that is why it's a huge responsibility is this is what these people are hoping for they are coming to you with a with no hope but actually still hoping My colleague from Syria, they told me once that we failed to achieve justice and first Russia bombarded Aleppo and then Russia bombarded Mariupol. As because Russians have never been punished for those that they did in Syria. Please tell us, what do you need to get success? Because your success will be our success. Justice, it's a very fragile thing because something which is clear for us has to be proven to the court. To, and you have to demonstrate a solid evidence in competitive court process. Court, it's not a god. He or she, I mean judges, uh, don't reveal the truth. They reveal the proven truth. Even if you are right, but have no evidence, you will fail in the court. Once again, it's it's artificial creature of human hands, not God invention. That is why it's a huge responsibility. Uh, but when we speak about Mariupol and other cities and people who survived from Russian cruelty, I think it's a huge motivation for lawyers to from different countries for to fight for truth and to help us. Uh, let me tell you one story uh, from Mariupol. I, I uh, never interview children because you have to to get a special knowledge how to do it and frankly speaking I I don't think that I can interview children because like I feel so shame that we, we as a adults can't stop this horror for children so I, I don't know whether or not I will be able to conduct the conversation or I will just cry when I will hear the children what's but my colleagues uh, from other organizations they do this work and this is a story of one uh, boy from Mariupol you know that when Russia um, troops try to siege uh, try to occupy some city they siege the city 
they destroyed deliberately residential block to another residential block, all civil infrastructure, hospitals, deliberately. And they forced people to live in basement without uh, electricity, water, food, medical care for weeks and for months. And when they tried to occupy it, Mariupol, you remember it was winter, it was very cold, and people hid a snow just to have a water. Yeah. And parallel, uh, Russia don't provide uh, people opportunity to leave the city. They have never get, go, get permission to International Committee of Red Cross to start such peaceful evacuation from Mariupol to another Ukrainian regions, because they need this uh, citizen there, they need their suffering. Because their suffering, don't let Ukrainians defenders to concentrate to the fight, because they have solved hundreds issue to help people to survive. Uh, so this is a context, and in this context, this boy and his mother, they uh, went under shelling, Russian shelling, and mother was injured in head, and the boy in leg. And this uh, injured mother, I don't know how, maybe with mother love, they, they managed to um, evacuate your injured son to, to a safe uh, place. I don't remember their own flat or flat of their neighbors. Have to check this. But what what's make me said the most in the story when they got, get to this peaceful place they um, lay hugging each other for some part of time and his mother pass in his hand and this is something which have never happened with any children in the world. You were now in Luxembourg in the meeting of uh, NATO... Parliamentary Assembly of NATO. No. What was it about? You were invited to to speak about what and to whom exactly? Who who was your addressee? Um, to delegates of uh, Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, I was invited to speak about Russian war crimes. I did it. It's my field of competence. I worked for nine years to document Russian war crimes, but also I go beyond the topic and I. Uh, ask uh, delegates of parliamentary assembly to switch from the narrative let's help Ukraine not to lose to another narrative let's help Ukraine to win fast we are very often told that we are fighting not just for Ukraine but for the whole Europe if it's so and if our common goal is to make Ukraine win fast why do we wait in for one year for, for modern tanks why we are wasting time for discussion for one year about F-16 fighter jets. And why? Why do you think this? Because we still have to set a common goal. That our common goal to have Ukraine win fast, because if we not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further. So not enough political will from the international community? Um, we are on the right track. The problem is that we have no time. We are dying. People dying in the battlefield, people dying in occupied territories, people dying in the prayer. I understand all these discussions and procedures, but the time for us converted into death. Ukraine in NATO, would that solve uh, a lot of issue if you were in NATO before in 2008? Sure, Russia will never attack. It's a logic of um, authoritarian leaders. They attack weak side. They respect only force. Can Ukraine become a member of NATO now during the war? 
This was something which I asked during this parliamentary assembly. Mm -hmm. I told that Ukraine deserved to be a member of NATO. We share common values on democracy and freedom, and we are ready to defend them. Also, we can be contributor to Euro-Atlantic security, not just beneficiary. It's not a promise, it's a matter of fact. We've proven that on the battlefield that we can fight with Russian army. Only us have such experience. To continue on what you say about that, uh, our contribution to global security, I think the uh, fact that we have the precedent when we volunteering to uh, give up our uh, nuclear uh, weapon. And it's very ironic that now Russia funded us uh, the same rocket which we need for them. The problem is that Russia will not give up their nuclear weapons. Yeah. This is a problem. I will tell you the story about um, the situation around um, Ukraine, like defending Ukraine's interests here in Brussels. For one year, uh, pro-Russian activists did not show up. We did not hear them, we did not see them, especially after Bucha, it was not at all an issue, no Russians uh, in Brussels. So we finished our demonstration, one hour later, Pro-Russians came to the headquarters and with the Z sign on their shirts with all those uh, Russian, um, the Georgievs Kastrichka, and they asked to stop the war between US and Russia on Ukraine's territory, that NATO leads the war. After one hour, pro-Russians are coming and demonstrating for um, their cause, which later was used as propaganda in their media, Rio Novosti, and it was all over the news in Rio Novosti that uh, there is a pro-Russian demonstration in, uh, in Brussels. I think that it's very good that Finland became a member of NATO, for sure. And I know that it's very difficult to, to express our experience to people in Brussels, in Berlin, in Geneva, in other beautiful, peaceful cities and settlements, because war is something inhuman and it's difficult to imagine when you drink your coffee in beautiful cafe in in stockholm that people have to hit a snow uh, to 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 have a water it's very difficult to imagine that it's huge comparison between civilized level and this barbaristic when there is no human dignity at all. That is why some things which is very understandable for Ukrainians is still not understandable to people abroad. And that is why we have to be very patient and try to explain them. Yeah, but you know that the difficult to explain them, it's always you, you, you should to get this balance between to uh, like a, uh, not criticize but like asking something yeah, and to be uh, grateful for this, you know, because uh, here, for example, in Belgium, yeah, um, when the, the the politicians they uh, like when um, you very um, like a. Um, come on the knees to ask something, you know, mm -hmm. without any dignity or something like this. And we, for example, when we talk with a, a, a woman who is responsible for the federal budget, and we talk about that integrate uh, Ukrainians uh, in the labor market here, uh, and we talk about the, some mm, initiatives which can to help, and uh, then we start to talk about that uh, business come here and people who Mm, all their life they was a businessman yeah uh, and they want to continue and uh, we start talking about it and you know what she said for us she said I'm very 
I'm very happy that Ukrainians such type of people. That they're entrepreneurial, but here in Belgium they should start working and not uh, yes. being entrepreneurial. Uh, f- f- first, you ne- before you start to fly, you need to uh, learn how to walk in. No, it's, uh, we have the worker. We, we need the drivers. We need the people in the factory, etc., etc. And I'm looking on her, and I, I understand that she totally not understand the con- uh, context of the situation and what we try to explain her, because she see only from her own point of view that she need to uh, find the people to put on these places uh, um, to work, and she there doesn't gaps. care about. Uh, what, what you feel uh, like you, about your dignity or something like this, you know? There is gaps. Uh, there is gap in, mis- in understanding of politicians and, uh, and not only Ukrainians. I have feeling it's just a general uh, non-understanding of how situation is. Um, but you know, you, you say we have to explain to people, we have to to Belgians uh, and to those who take decisions. Another example that is. Uh, we just don't know anymore how to explain, you know, how to explain to them when Ukrainian uh, serviceman was beheaded a few months ago, two months ago. Uh, we wanted to do the demonstration near the Russian mission to the EU with the uh, mannequin and uh, with the uh, red color, with the paint and with, yeah, to take the head of the mannequin out to visualize this because this is something that happened in the eyes of millions of people they watched it and we wanted to bring this to those who didn't watch so that they feel that they know what's what 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 millions of people are feeling when they see something like this happening and all what what victims of those crimes feel the mother of the of the serviceman what she felt so we asked the police whether we can do this kind of demonstration to visualize and to uh, sensibilize people and they said no because it would be too shocking for them so this is something we cannot do i in a way i understand but in the other way i just don't know anymore how to communicate this kind of uh, of crimes people are forgetting they don't want they shut down every time we have to search for creative methods but we are out of, of methods we don't have them anymore um we have to remember that Ukrainians, before the large-scale invasion started, also was not very sensible towards Syria. We behave the same. It's a common problem, not just people abroad. I, I mention it because it's return us to the understanding that we behave the same towards people in Syria. How much people in Ukraine look in the news what's going on. I know what I'm telling about because when bombarding of Aleppo started, I organized protests near Russian embassy. And we have thousands of people who joined these protests, not thousands. Not because people are cruel, but because they, they, the, this war is far from them and they can switch this war avoiding looking news, uh, read articles, etc., etc. Don't want to see the shocking uh, content and to preserve the distance. It's very natural. But the truth is that our world is very interconnected. And once again, because Russian bombarded Aleppo, later they bombarded Mariupol. People in Ukraine who can switch off the war in Syria now can't switch the war in Ukraine. I wish other nations to learn from our lessons. We have to fight, I will, because there are a lot of things which have no limitation in national borders. Only spread of freedom can make our world safer. And what means me more optimistic in this regard, because I see that even in the countries which are far from the context, when I speak about Russian war crimes, which you documented. The mother who lost her baby, just born baby with two days, and now told that her Sergei came to her in dream, like her baby came to her when she tried to sleep. 
this pain of this mother who lost her child is understandable to every people regardless their citizenship their political views their ideology their religion their social status profession and the things because first and foremost we're all human beings so we have to understand that there is something which unites us and people are not cruel and indifferent in their majority we have to find a way how to communicate with them